Hello and welcome to a video on inverse functions. So you're looking at Sylvester McBean's inverse function that's a machine that the Sneetches when they go in and they have no star on their belly they come out and they have a star upon theirs. But when they got the stars upon theirs it upset the other Sneetches that already had stars upon theirs. <clears throat> And so they didn't feel like they were better anymore. So they went to Sylvester McBean and they asked to remove the stars from theirs, from theirs. And so they could still be different because they wanted to be better than the other Sneetches. So they had their stars removed. So when you go into one machine that puts stars on your belly, and then you go after that, you go into another machine that removes a star from your belly. The question I have is, what do you look like when you're done? And the answer is exactly what you look like when you went in. And if you went the other way around and you started out being a Sneetch that already has a star upon theirs, they have the star removed. And then after removing it, they go into the second machine that places a star on their belly. Then what do they look like when they're done? And the answer is the same. They look exactly the way they looked when they entered the first machine. These machines are doing inverse functions upon, uh, upon the inputs. <clears throat> So what will the Sneetches look like? Exactly the way they looked before they went into either. Now this suggests one of the first important properties of inverses. And that is that if you take the composite of an inverse, you end up where you started. In other words, if you take the inner function of the inverse, which could be in this case, it could be the stars on machine, and you take the output from the inner function and you place it into the outer function, you're going to get x back out, exactly what you started with. So let's see what that looks like when we talk about our facts about inverses. Two functions are inverses if f of g of x is equal to x and g of f of x equals x. Okay, and there it is, and this is called the inverse test. So for example, the input could be a Sneetch that has no star upon their belly. And then they go into the first function which places a star on their belly. And then after that they take the output which is now a Sneetch with a star in its belly and they go through its inverse which removes the star and they end up exactly like they started. So the input is the same as the output. And it's the same thing if they started out with a star and they had it removed and then put it back on. They, they come out the same way as they started. All right, it's a very non-mathematical analogy, but it's exactly what an inverse is. Okay, and I'd like to introduce some notation for inverse, and this is it right here. This is, um, it looks like f to the negative 1, but you're never going to hear me saying f to the negative 1 of x. You're going to hear me saying f inverse of x. That's usually how I would say this one when I write it, f inverse of x. Sometimes I'll say the inverse of f of x. Okay, that's what this means. So again, it is not an, not an exponent. It doesn't mean 1 over f of x. Again, it does not mean 1 over f of x. So remember that. It just means the inverse. Okay? And it can be, it doesn't have to be f. It could be g or any function, anything in that position where you're looking at a function notation like what you see right here. Okay? All right. Okay, what is f inverse of x? f inverse of x is the set of all points y, x, such that or where x, y is in the original function. So f inverse of x is the inverse of a function, and we're talking about that function when we talk about what the inverse is. So that function has the points x, y. That means the inverse will have the points y, x. And that's for any point on the function it has that inverse value. Okay, so another way to say that is that is that the domain of the function is the range of its inverse and the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. That's basically saying exactly the same thing as saying you, if you have the x, y's in one function, you're going to have the y axis in the other. Okay, if a function is one to one, then it has an inverse and that inverse is also a function. So I'm giving you two examples of some basic parent functions here. One of them is the square root of x, which is a one to one function, and so it does have an inverse. So this is 1 to 1. And a, another example that is not 1 to 1, and that's y equals x, where this is not 1 to 1. And one way that you can tell very easily is, A, we know it's a function if it passes the vertical line test, and we know that it's a 1 to 1 function if it also passes the horizontal line test. And the y equals square root of x looks like it passes both tests, while y equals x squared 
looks like it only passes one of the tests. So the inverse of this function um, is going to be something like this. Um, this is the inverse. And then there is no inverse of this function. There is an inverse, but it's not, um, it's not a function. Okay. Okay, and then the third fact about inverse functions is a visual fact, and that is you could look at the graph and see it. So two functions are inverses if and only if their reflections of each other are over the line y equals x. So you can see it in the example that I gave you. If you put the line y equals x right there in the middle, one function is the reflection of the other over the line y equals x, and that's always the case. Okay. Okay, so now we have some idea what a, what a function and an inverse function, how they're, they're connected. We're going to look at functions in the form of or a set of ordered pairs. That's the first example from a graph. And then the third example will be from an equation. All right, and that's the one that m most people think of when they think of inverses, but these are all valid. Okay, so first of all, and students sometimes have a hard time with this, but when you're looking at a function as a set of ordered pairs, and I tell you f of x is the set of, looks like five ordered pairs, don't look for a pattern, don't think that there's more to it. That is the function, okay? We're not talking about you got to find the pattern, you got to find the other points in there. That's the function. So f inverse of x would be a five-point function as well, and the five points would be in set notation, they would just be all of the ordered pairs with switched x and y. So a negative 5, 1 would become 1, negative 5. 3, 3, when you switch it, can't even tell. 0, 0, same thing. You can't even tell when you switch that one. 2, negative 4 would become negative 4, 2. I'm not changing any values. I'm just switching their positions. And then 7, negative 8 would become negative 8, 7. All right, so let's close this with some brackets. Now we know that that's a set of ordered pairs. The domain of the function is a set of ordered pairs as well. It's the set of all x values of the f of x, so the original function. So it's going to be negative 5, 3, 0, 2, and 7. All the x values of f of x. And the range of f of x would be all of the y values of f of x. So the y values of f of x are 1, 3, 0, negative 4, and negative 8. Okay, well what about the domain of the inverse? Well we're looking at the inverse, so the domain is all of the x values of the inverse, which is 1, 3, 0, negative 4, and negative 8. Now let's just pause for a second and look at that and look at the range of f of x. And it's just like one, one of the facts about um, inverse is that the domain of the inverse right here, the domain of the inverse is the same as the range of the original function. And the same thing where the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function. So let's just write that as well. You can look in either place. You can look at the range of the inverse and get them from there. Or you can look at the domain of the function. Once you understand the connection, you can use either one. So it's going to be, anyway, negative 5, um, 3, 0, 2, 7. Okay. Now, just a little bit of uh, using function notation here. f of 2. Um, f of 2, looking up here, f of 2 is negative 4. That's it. And f inverse of negative 4, looking right here, f inverse of negative 4 is right there, so f inverse of negative 4 has an output of 2. Okay, that's from a table or from a uh, set of ordered pairs, which you could put into a table. All right, what about from a graph? All right, let's look at the domain. Now, looking at this graph, one might think that there's no arrow, but we're going to just assume that this goes on forever. Okay, so we're going to just assume, and you can even draw it in because, honestly, I don't even like it, but just some textbooks do it this way, and our textbook is one of them. Um, it goes on forever. So the domain of the function, we're looking at the function, is uh, negative 7 to infinity. We're going to see the same property of domain of the function being the range of the inverse again here. The range of the function is from 0 to infinity. Um, actually, you know what? We want to include that 0, don't we? And we actually want to include that negative 7, too. Okay. So the, well, f of 0 may as well look right here. So f of 0 is right here. 
and it looks like it's about 2.5. We'll just call it 2.5. It's it's uh, it's an estimate. And f of negative 2 looks like it's right here is negative 2, so maybe right there it looks like it's 2. So f of negative 2 we'll say is 2. Okay, now let's look at the inverse. Now for the inverse, we don't really have to draw the inverse to see this, but we, sh we could, if we wanted to, we could draw the inverse by drawing a dotted line here um, right through the middle. I'm going to pause it so I can get the ruler out and do this carefully. Okay, now I'm going to attempt to draw the reflection over this line, so something like that. And this part would be something like this, and it would come down to negative 7, something like this. Not exact science, but something like that. All right, that should look approximate like it's a reflection over the line y equals x. Now let's think about the domain of that. The domain of that looks like it would start at 0 and go to infinity, and it does, and that's actually the range of f of x, so it makes sense. So the domain here goes from 0 to infinity. We don't really even need to graph. We can just look at the domain and range of the function. And the range goes from negative 7 to infinity. And that is consistent with what we see on the graph. And f inverse of 3, um, f inverse of 3, we would have to look, we could look at the output being 3 and see where its input is. So we could just look on the original function where the output is 3. So 1, 2, 3, a height of 3, something like that, and it looks like it's about 4. It's a, again, it's, it's a little tough to tell for sure, but it looks like that's about 4. And then f, of, f inverse of 0 means we want to know where the output is 0 on the original function, and that's clearly negative 7. Or you could look at the inverse that we drew. Okay, let's look at equations finally, the, the one that we're going to see the most of and the one that's going to be the most useful throughout the class. All right, so steps for finding inverse from an equation. You first switch x and y, you solve for y, and then you can check your work by using that check that I showed you earlier with the composite functions. Okay, so I'm going to show you the inverse. Okay, so I wrote the function with a y instead of an f of x. I just replaced f of we replaced f of x with y. Then I switched x and y. Now I'm going to solve for y. Now when you look at this, sometimes people think, how can you solve for y? There's two of them. Just go with it. You can. Just multiply both sides by y minus 1. You get um, x, y minus x equals 2y plus 1. Get all your y's on one side. So I'm going to subtract 2y from both sides. Um, actually, and then I'm going to also add x to both sides. So minus 2y and plus x. And what I get on the left side will be xy minus 2y. On the right side, I'm just going to get x plus 1. Now factor out the common factor of y. So y times x minus 2 equals x plus 1. Divide both sides by y minus 2, and you get y equals x plus 1 over x minus 2. And that is the inverse of the function x plus 1 over x minus 2. So we've got a function here and we have its inverse. We found the inverse, now let's just confirm it by checking it. So the, the confirmation would be to find f of f inverse of x and to find f inverse of f, oops, f inverse of f of x. So f of f inverse of x would be f of x plus 1 over x minus 2, which means I put that into the original function. I'm going to get a complex fraction here. So I'm going to get 2 times x plus 1 over x minus 2 plus 1. That's the numerator of the function. And then the denominator would be x plus 1 over x minus 2 minus 1. Now let's simplify that. Okay, so I got a common denominator here of x minus 2 in both the, the numerator and the denominator, and I ended up getting some cancellations, 3x over 3, and I got x. Okay, let's try the other one. Okay, it's also x. So I've got f of f inverse of x equals f inverse of f of x, which equals x. Okay, hope you found this helpful.